Um, we're gonna, so welcome to the ASDF uh, uh, working group. Um, and uh, we'll just go through things here. There we go. So note well, um, you've probably seen this already, but if you haven't, then uh, please take a look at, um, at the note well, ask some questions. Um, and there's quite a number of people that you can come to, friendly ADs, working group chairs. Um, please be uh, nice and professional. Um, we're a pretty small group. So if you have something to interject, then um, to the extent of, of politeness, please just do that. Um, you can just turn on the mic or you can go, go in the queue if you aren't ready, if you aren't trying to speak to the point, uh, but you have another point, then um put yourself in the queue and we'll get to you but if you we just want to interact on a one on a particular point then i would say don't stand on the the queue at this point uh so there's some more details of the note well um you want to said know what's going on be, read bcp9 and uh the other ones there i'm sure you've all seen it so uh today we're going to go through a bunch of things specifically um status update on the group, and then we're going to get right into the SDF 1.1 features and the results from the hackathon. Is there any other items that someone thinks needs to go into the agenda at this point? Now's the time to ask. Hearing none, we're going to move on. So uh, there is a Kodi IMD for, which is an ether pad for the notes. Ari is, uh, is adding things, please feel free to add, correct, and uh, copy and paste as you wish into it um, to things. Um, we are using Meet Echo. If you aren't on it, uh, then you probably can't hear me, but you may be on the audio queue. Um, there is a Jabber room that you can connect directly to, or you can also click on the tab with the two red, well, they're red on my screen balloons um, to there. Um, and the blue sheet is managed by Meet Echo, so you don't need to do anything. And we have a note taker already. So uh, our working group was, in fact, chartered um, finally in October. Um, my name is Michael Richardson, and my colleague is Nicholas Waddell. Um, we are the co-chairs of this working group. So hello, and thank you for coming. Um, we had a bit of a hallway meeting uh, as the working group was uh, in the still in the pro pro uh, forming process. And we did a bit of a, a YouTube, uh, SDF 1.0 tutorial. Um, so basically the results of that are on YouTube. If you wanna know a lot about SDF then, and how it came to be, then please go there. Um, and we'll be doing a little bit, a few minutes of that here. Uh, we did have one virtual interim, um, November 2, as I recall. Um, and we adopted uh, the initial draft, IETF, ASDF, SDF, that's a bit of, alliteration there. Um, and so that is our 1.0 at this point, and we are working now on 1.1. There was a hackathon, which we're gonna hear about uh, last week, where a number of issues with, uh, or, or limitations with what we've called 1.0 um, uh, were uh, discussed and some solutions found. And today our plans are basically to, uh, to have this meeting and then we're gonna plan essentially a virtual interim on approximately a monthly basis. Um, and so we're looking to schedule one in December, um, middle way. Um, and hopefully that time period that we pick for December will we'll repeat every month um, for a number of months. Uh, so we have a mailing list. If you're not on it, you can get on it by going to this, this link. Um, standard mailman type process. Uh, we are working in GitHub with the RFCs typically, so you will see issues um, being discussed in GitHub. Uh, Nicholas and I, I believe we have not yet hooked up the uh, GitHub summary to mailing list um, webhook, um, and, but we will be doing that. So there will be at least a weekly summary coming to the mailing list of things that have, have occurred on GitHub. Um, and we will, of course, uh, expect that the authors will bring any large contentious type issues to the mailing list for a summary of what's going on there. Um, and the goal of the working group is we are going to be running in a kind of implementation uh, 
uh, draft where we will say that certain things are relatively stable and could be go into code and other things may be less stable, but we'll basically identify uh, which documents are considered stable enough to be implemented uh, by the various filtering converters that are, are already out there, the tool chains. Um, and it's a goal after a couple of iterations of this that uh, we will get to the point where we're ready to publish a, a RFC. So I'm turning this over to you, Nicholas, to, to, to give us the short tutorial, the five minute version. Yes, or even a two minute version. Um, we have, uh, as Michael said, we have done tutorials previously, but this is just to give you a brief uh, uh, overview of, of what this is all about or where this came from, the SDF work and so on. Uh, the problem we started out with uh, two years ago was basically that there were several standardized uh, IoT data models and and the um, uh, I mean OCF, OMA, Zigbee and so on. And uh, so while they were standardized they were not really compatible and while they could be work made to work together uh, there was a high integration cost uh, because there is basically no sort of standardized interoperability between these models. And um, so there was a group form called One Data Model and a and, uh, liaison group between these couple of different SDOs. Uh, first, we tried to um, address this by selecting one so solution, but that did not work. Uh, and then we came up with the solution to actually, instead of trying to uh, select one, we actually introduce a new uh, layer that facilitates translation between the different data models uh, via a neutral format that was uh, uh, that could help with this translation. And uh, this proved very successful. So we have um, uh, translation established uh, between a couple of these different um, ecosystems um, uh, via this neutral format. And this neutral format is what's the topic about today, the semantic definition format, and uh, which is now in ITF. So this slide was used a bit old, but it's now in ITF as this working group. And uh, so in addition to the work in the ASDF group, there's also the work in the one data model, Lyshen group, there's a link to it at the bottom here. Please go there if you want more information because they are doing uh, couple of complementary things to the stuff in ASDF. So while the format is defined, specified, and developed in, in IATF, uh, there is uh, work on tool chains, work on sort of enabling this interoperability between the ecosystems. And also there is work to, to define a set of harmonized uh, thing models or device models that can be used widely across these different ecosystems. So this was just a super quick recap to give you some frame of, of what this is all about. And so the rest of this meeting, of course, will be around SDF and um, the work in the ASDF group. But this provides some frame about what this is all about. Yes, next slide. Um, so, uh, so just a few words around uh, the ASDF work. As Michael said, we just kicked off. This means that we were, we are, would like to reach out to additional organizations. We start out with the, the, with the organizations that are in in one DM, of course, but we are super happy to bring in others. And obviously, the value of ASDF increases uh, uh, with the more that other organizations join, and we can create interoperability between all the largest set of organizations. So far, in the short period since we launched, we have been doing two things. Uh, one is um, uh, we presented the ASDF work to OMAS Beckworks, a DMSC group, working a lot with M2M. And another thing is that SDF, uh, as, as the previous version, uh, is now part of a proposal to ISO IEC JTC1 uh, SC41 uh, for IoT thing modeling in their architectural work. Um, and this will, of course, eventually re refer to the final RFC coming out of this group. So uh, this is a bit of a call to action. Uh, if your organization works with IoT data models and you're not already involved, please let us know and talk to us, and we can try to uh, loop you in and, and bring on board in this. Yes, that was all. about from Eve about what kind of responses were, were received in L2, LWM2M and the JTC1. Is it, is it, are you in a position to, to tell, to relate what happened there? 
Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So in in uh, light with M2M uh, or in DMSC, uh, the uh, response was this looks interesting, and uh, we want to look at it and discuss it more. Uh, of course, it fits since one of the groups going into this work was uh, the IPSO group in MS Backworks, and obviously the models are very much related. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good fit. But then, of course, it's, it is also a, a kind of uh, you need to do some translation. Um, and um, uh, and on the uh, ISO JTC1, uh, SC41, uh, it actually will be on discussed tomorrow. Uh, so I don't have a. Uh, it's a new work. It's a new work item proposal being submitted from the Swedish standards unit, but uh, it's not yet um, uh, decided on how to bring it forward. But it's part of it. So the the awareness has been has been uh, raised in in this community as well about this work. Good point. Thank you. Okay, um, so I think I'm supposed to, to speak to these, the next few slides. Um, I'm Carsten Bormann. Um, I got dragged into the Vandium work about a year ago, and uh, I have uh, not invented anything that's in there. Um, I have just tried to make it a, a document that, that people can use <clears throat> that, that uh, ultimately will, will be able to get uh, standardized. So uh, let's talk about this this weird numbering scheme here, SDF 1.1. Um, usually in the IGF we, we number things dash 00, dash 01, uh, and so on. And what we are trying to do here is have a few of these dash something versions be qualified as implementation drafts. So they, they kind of represent, that's the, the, the objective, they represent working group consensus at the time with a full knowledge that we will learn new things uh, when using it and um, therefore we'll, we'll need to make further iterations. Um, so SDF 1.1 will be a, a dash 03 or dash 02 or whatever happens um, that, that we actually have had something like, like a a small working group last call for, and uh, we agree we want to publish this. Well, not really publish, we want to, to uh, label the internet draft um, as SDF 1.1. Uh, and we probably will have a 1.2 and a 1.3, and maybe even a 1.4 uh, before we actually submit this to the ISG as, as a, a standard track um, for, uh, for submission as a standard track RFC. So that's when, when I talk about SDF 1.1, uh, we are, we are <clears throat> uh, according to my reckoning, about halfway on the way between 1.0, which was the initial submission to the IGF, and 1.1. And um, next slide. Um, so we have uh, collected a number of open issues in the GitHub. That doesn't mean uh, we will not look at any other open issues uh, uh, any more after we have closed these, uh, but these are the ones that, that apparently receive the, the largest amount of interest uh, from people who uh, wanted to convert their ecosystem-specific data models into something that can be expressed uh, in, in SDF. I, I'm going to go through these issues in, in more detail. Uh, Later, uh, issue number three really is about something that already is in SDF 1.0, but we hadn't really tested enough yet, so we had to do the, the validation. And one tiny thing came up that we, uh, number, that we uh, term number seven, so how, how do you use these references? Can you override, can you augment them? Uh, issue number four is uh, we punted on supporting compound data composition uh, for 1.0, and uh, I think we now understand uh, what we can do there. So that was one of the, the results of the hackathon. And then the, the third uh, big uh, area is one of uh, uh, expressing not, not uh, conjunction like, like here, but disjunction. So you, you have a choice between different alternatives. And uh, we had two uh, proposals, one based on enums, one based on, on uh, JSON schema orgs, any of, 
uh, and uh, I come to, to a proposal how to work with that later. Uh, next slide. Uh, so at the hackathon, we we mostly tested out uh, the 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 view we have of issue three. Uh, we came up with a convention on using the curries that is a little bit surprising. Come to that in a minute. Um, and uh, we discussed how we can manage these namespaces uh, in a way that supports the progress of a model from an ecosystem uh, model to a converged uh, model and, and uh, well, the various uh, transitions while in those uh, stages. And on issue four, uh, well, we used the, the discussion about compound types of aggregation to also fix a few warts in, in uh, 1.0. So with that, let's, uh, next slide, jump into issue number three and a little bit issue number seven, next slide. Um, so we, we, we can, uh, instead of writing something into the model, we can write a reference into the model and that reference points either to a different place within the same model or to a different model and imports some, some spec. Uh, this is based on, on JSON pointers uh, right now, and uh, we, we generally know that JSON pointers work, so so that, that was not an issue. Uh, but we w weren't so sure that the way the, the space is being managed uh, was a good way. And uh, we also never really tested out what what we can reference there. Um, so uh, initially this focused on data types via SDF data, um, and I think we are not completely done with thinking about uh, referencing uh, other things. Next slide. So here's an example. Uh, let's say we, we have defined a, a data type uh, uh, that we call length, and that is obviously a number. Uh, length cannot be less than zero. Uh, the SI unit is uh, meter, or oh, this is using the old name, sorry. Um, and uh, there's also a description, well, that, that probably needs to be longer than, than here in this uh, example. And then later on, if we have uh, the, the cable length measurement from the TDR, TDR unit in, in a, a router, then this can give us uh, uh, something that is like a length, uh, but the TDR unit really cannot uh, show anything about cables of at least five centimeters. So uh, we actually modify this description uh, a little bit. So th this is one example where we had to decide uh, whether we, we want to allow this kind of overriding. Um, so it, this is uh, actually uh, following the Liskov principle here uh, because the, the second one is a subset of the first one. But uh, of course, when you can override anything, you, you you're not forced to follow the Liskov principle. Next slide. Um, so in, in practice, this would occur in an SDF property uh, declaration. Um, and uh, so SDF data is just a place where you can define things that can be referenced or, or data types that can be referenced. And this is not by itself declaring an affordance. The affordance is declared in the SDF property. So there is something called cable length that you can read out uh, from from the device. Next slide. So when we do this between different uh, specifications, uh, then of course we have to manage a namespace that is much larger. And uh, we decided to have a global namespace that is based on URIs. These URIs are not necessarily meant to be uh, resolvable, but uh, they, they are names. And uh, using a namespace table and a default namespace, uh, we can say the, the length that is uh, being uh, declared uh, up here in the yellow uh, part, uh, defined actually not declared, uh, that can be referenced in the white part um, using an SDF ref that points to that namespace. And interestingly, the namespace names can differ. The interesting part about the namespace is not its namespace name, which is a local matter in a specification, but uh, the, the URL. So the, the white part says namespace foo is example.com. And so we can reference it from there. So that, that's how the slide looked a month ago. And now next slide, uh, we have changed this a little bit. And you probably had to watch closely to see the difference. 
Um, so we, we actually moved the, the uh, hash mark down to the reference. And uh, why does that make sense? Um, go another slide forward. Um, that uh, leads to uniform reference because the, the uh, reference to a local item uh, looks the, the same way now as a reference to, to an item that is in the default namespace. Uh, so you can actually take out parts of, of a, a spec, put it somewhere else without having to edit the whole uh, spec. And th that's a win, although it's a little bit more conventional in the RDF community to have the hash mark in, in the uh, namespace definition and not in the reference. So that, that's one of the things that, that came out of the um, hackathon. Um, so that, that's, I think, pretty much resolved. We, we think we understand how this is uh, being used and in the exploratory part of the uh, uh, 1DM repository, we have uh, a couple of dozen examples that, that make use of this in one or the other uh, way. But of course, so we should use all time we have to experiment further with this and uh, find out uh, whether we uh, maybe also um, want to uh, use this in different contexts than just referencing data types. And uh, Michael says in the chat, uh, please step up if you have questions about this. Um, and uh, Christian asked, um, the semantics of curries are still plain concatenation? And the answer is yes. Um, so uh, what, what really happens here is that the, the hash slash SDF data set slash length is uh, um, appended to HTTPS example com. Um, so the, the path part is what gives you the, the uniqueness and the part behind hash is a fragment identifier, a JSON fragment identifier that takes the form of a uh, of an RFC 6901 pointer, JSON pointer, uh, that says uh, up there in, in that uh, uh, document, uh, uh, look under SDF data length and you you find it there. I find myself, I'm, I'm so used to big blue button as a conferencing system that I'm pointing to places and Meet Echo doesn't support that. Um, um, sorry, um, that you cannot see my pointer. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, any more questions about issue number three? So, of course, you, you all should read the new text that is in Dash01 uh, about this and check whether it fully represents this. Uh, but I think that this is also pretty much non-controversial or should be. Next slide. So, so this means with that issue three can be closed, right? Or not quite. Uh, so th there's this. Um, if if you go to slide fourteen, um, th there is this uh, little uh, question of can we import entire affordances or, or even more? Could we import a whole SDF data uh, section? So I, I think that that needs to be understood what that actually means and and. Uh, uh, or whether we are limited to essentially pointing to something that is below SDF data. So that, that small part, maybe you should make a new issue out of that so we can close number three. Hmm. Okay, so let's move on to slide number 20. Karsten, I just want to clarify. So what you're saying is that we can't point at, for instance, type. We can only point at length. Is that what I understood you to say? Um, th that's what I'm proposing. Okay, just wanted to make sure I understood the statement. Yeah, so uh, you can you can write down a JSON pointer for anything. The question really is what 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 uh, are the JSON pointers that are valid in an SDF ref? There's also SDF required, which probably has a different set from the SDF ref set. So for both cases, we should uh, decide which are the, the sets of things that these pointers should be pointing to. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Uh, issue number four. 
Um, so this is about uh, composition or aggregation, as I have been calling that, or compound types. Uh, we have many, many terms for this. It essentially means that we are constructing something uh, out of multiple uh, parts. And uh, we punted uh, on that for, for SDF 1.0, uh, uh, but we couldn't completely punt it, so we had something awkward uh, for composing parameter lists. Um, and uh, this is on, on the way out now that we have uh, real uh, composition. Uh, and um, yeah, so um, one the, the thing that is on, on the second to last bullet here um, is uh, really what exactly does the reference uh, mean uh, and uh, what, what actually should, should be overridable uh, there and can we compose affordances as well as uh, uh, just uh, types. So next slide. Um, so this is an example in, in the new uh, syntax where we have two properties. Uh, one is called simple one. This could be the uh, name of, of uh, the device and the compound one, which uh, might be the, the location of the device. And, and element one is the GPS coordinates and element two is the street address. So. Uh, whatever. So uh, we have uh, a compound property, and uh, the, the, this, of course, could also be modeled as separate properties, element one and element two. Uh, but in writing such a specification, th there is a certain uh, tendency to, to group things. Um, so it's useful to have the, the compound stuff. Um, we decided to use uh, the same syntax JSON schema org uses for JSON objects. And that, that's maybe a little bit confusing because we are not saying that this property then is represented as a JSON object. Uh, because we are at the information model level. We are not at the level where we would make representation decisions uh, like that. Uh, but because we are using a data modeling language to represent information models, it's pretty normal that we, we use one way of representing things as, as a, a stand-in for the information model uh, property that we are trying to represent here. And, uh, well, a JSON object is a good way to, to group things uh, uh, together into a bigger thing. JSON schema org also has a required and that thing is called property, sorry. Um, in, in the uh, compound, uh, the word property means at least three things here. Um, so this can be used to say the, that uh, certain of the, the map keys, key value pairs, are required and others are optional. This is a bit clumsy, but uh, uh, I think generally the feeling was that uh, we, want, we want to stick with what JSON schema org is using uh, there to, to uh, follow the principle of least surprise. So that's where we uh, came out. Next slide. And now that we have it, we can also use this to build the parameter lists uh, for actions and events. So actions have input data and output data. And um, in 1.0, we essentially build the input data and the output data as arrays of references to SDF data, uh, which means we could point to data, but we couldn't uh, say what these data actually meant. So we can't say whether the, the intensity value that we are pointing to is a red, green, or a blue uh, intensity value. And with the new uh, way of structuring things, we have to write a little bit more JSON, uh, but now we can actually uh, put in uh, names here. So for instance, the input data is the amount of squeezing you get uh, from the hug, and, and the output data is the amount of comfort you get. Um, now, if you look at this, you may think, oh, there, there was a data type up there in 1.0, and that already had the information. Um, and that works as long as all your, your input data elements have sufficiently different data types. But we ran into examples like the red, green, blue uh, light where the data types are actually the same, 
Uh, so the, the data type reference in 1.0 didn't tell you what it was. And then now we, we get this um, in, in the name like squeeze or, or comfort here. So this is, uh, once we made the decision to, to live with the fact that people might mistake with uh, this with uh, just plain JSON objects, um, I think this was a, a no-brainer. Um, so, um, yeah, this is the solution for aggregation and, and the little fix we could uh, make based on this. So again, we, we before we close number four, we should uh, think whether there are other kinds of aggregation that we uh, need, but uh, this kind of aggregation, data types and, and parameter lists, uh, this is uh, now taken care of. Questions? So let's go to the, ne to the next slide. Um, we have two issues, issue number two and number five, next slide, uh, that, that actually, uh, when you examine them closely, are uh, the same. Uh, issue number two was about uh, using the, the something like the JSON schema org enum uh, facilities, which allows you to define a type as a choice between a number of values. So you, you put in an array uh, with uh, values. And uh, yeah, so um, this uh, gives you values, but it doesn't really help you in actually defining what these values mean. So there, there is no place in, in JSON schema org uh, enums to actually annotate them with, with uh, uh, any semantic uh, tags. Uh, so this, this was not something that, that we could use directly. And for a while we had various proposals called SDF enums, uh, which would be almost but not entirely unlike enums in that you had a way to, to put the semantic tag there. And the other thing was that the JSON schema also has an any of um, operator that can be used to uh, build a type union uh, of, of multiple uh, schema descriptions. Um, in 1.0, we didn't include uh, that. Um, we, we were hesitant uh, to do this because we hadn't uh, examined uh, alternatives or choices uh, yet. Um, so we could uh, actually put this in or, uh, yeah. Um, th there isn't much of a difference between the two because they both lack a way to put descriptive information on the alternatives. Um, so, um, yeah, th that's uh, what we looked at. We looked at a number of uh, examples. And uh, of course, the, the convenience value of, of the JSON schema org enums is that um, as it's usual, when, when you just give text strings, uh, then, then you think you know what these things mean. Um, but uh, it actually turns out uh, that that's not always very clear. And uh, just from, from a single text string that, that looks like an identifier in a programming language. Um, and there are also funny little things like, like typos in, in those text strings, which cause immense pain when you repair them. Um, uh, and so on. So uh, it's not necessarily exactly the, the way you want to uh, do things. Next slide. Uh, so uh, as usual, let's look at an example. So th this was uh, an example that, that had been uh, handed around for a while. Uh, we have a property called state and that has two uh, possible values on and off. And uh, of course we could model this as a Boolean, but, but that's not the point here. Uh, let's say you want to give them explicit names. Um, then uh, we would build an SDF enum with the two alternatives on and off, and we can put descriptions there and we can give the things labels um, and so on. So the, the labels are a bit redundant. Uh, we, we don't really have a, a a semantic foundation here. Of course, you can read the description, uh, but uh, somehow it would be nicer if we could uh, put a pointer to some RDF uh, in here. 
Um, yeah, and then we can write comments and, and we might even put other things there, uh, like ecosystem translations or whatever. So this is extensible. Next slide. Um, so I hope you can read this. Um, Hmm. Very nice. Yeah, that may be a bit much. Uh, <laughs> uh, 125 is probably the next you can do. Okay, so um, the uh, another example is, is uh, right from, I think, was it Zigbee or Bluetooth? I, I don't remember. Uh, so th they have a one byte a number that, that can go from 0 to 255. Uh, and uh, a number of these numbers, 1 to 254, are reserved to actually uh, give a startup level. So when, when you switch on the device, the lamp goes to intensity 1 to 254. And there, there is also an SDF enum in the any of alternative here that uh, has two additional values, minimum device value permitted, uh, which is zero, which is represented by zero, and set to previous value, which is represented by 255. So I'm, I'm not going to explain the, the logic of, of this device, um, but uh, the, the basic idea is that we, we have uh, uh, various alternatives here, and the, the difference between any of and SDF enum makes us uh, doing a, a interesting nesting uh, here, uh, which maybe is not, not something we always uh, want to do. Um, there's also the question whether the, the numbers that are given there really are information model level content or are not. So th there are some industry standards where where it's not hard to say uh, well uh, most uh, rgb uh, devices uh, have uh, something that's going from 0 to 255 so so let's go with that um, but there, there are other things where really different ecosystems have different numbers and we have to work about mapping uh, files to handle those and if you look over into the issue behind this then you see one example from the Michael Custer, how such a mapping file could uh, look like. Next slide. So um, this this is just an intermediate uh, uh, example. This is not even JSON syntax, but but uh, I think you can see what's going on here, um, which was an example of, of having three number ranges, 0 to 86, uh, 87 to 166, and 167 to 255. And these have different semantics, which are uh, uh, encoded in the label uh, there. Uh, so the, this uh, the choice mechanism might uh, be used for actually giving different semantics to different uh, number ranges, which is going one step further than the previous example. Next slide. Yeah, th this is the same thing in, in JSON syntax. Next slide. Um, so, um, the, the, the decision we really had to make is, um, is a choice just a type union? So, the, the various types that we unify uh, are, are essentially opened up and all the values are put into a big basket, which is the uh, type uh, union. So if, if values actually occur in, in several of the branches, uh, the assumption is that the same value means the same thing in each of the branch. So that's a type union. Um, and when, when we did the SIBA encoding of, of uh, Yang, this was probably the, the most expensive feature to have uh, type unions uh, like this. <clears throat> the, the alternative to that, is to say a choice is a set of named alternatives. Uh, so we, we actually want to attach semantic information to each branch. We want to label the graph that, that we set up here. And by putting in names, we can also put in other 
descriptive information like, like uh, RDF uh, references and so on. And my proposal for today is to always go for uh, named alternatives. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, yeah, this is uh, just recapping how our JSON schema all does this. Uh, maybe next slide. Um, so uh, the the uh, state example essentially just replaces SDF enum with choice. It's otherwise the same thing. Um, and uh, maybe we don't need the labels. We can uh, probably use the uh, branch names as, as default uh, labels, but you can add labels uh, in, in any data type in um, SDF. And we could also add semantic tab tags uh, that, that ground this in, in some terminology. Next slide. And this is the, the example that, that mixed any of and um, SDF uh, enum, and we now have a single choice that has uh, both kinds of alternatives uh, uh, integrated. So we don't need the unnecessary nesting. Uh, all the alternatives are named. So the, the third, the top level alternative is now named actual uh, setting and it can have a description and so on. So that's pretty much the resolution that uh, I'm proposing for number two and number five. So if we can go back one slide again. Um, any discussion of this re resolution here? Could go back to the example that it was before, the one that we blew up. Slide 27, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, I have to click on the thing on the window. So this had an any of, and then it had a bunch of things down buried into it, right? And this one has this choice. Yeah, so it's different from any of because it's not an array, it's actually a map, a JSON object. And it's different from SDF enum because we are not giving values here, singleton values, but we are giving types, which of course in turn can be singleton values if we use something like const uh, in, in the type definition. We have Ari in the queue. Ari, go ahead. Yeah, actually, so uh, Michael Foster also wrote a comment in the notes. Maybe Michael wants to go first. Okay, Michael. My comment, um, well, my first comment was that this also kind of resolves the dilemma we had between one of and any of in jsonschema.org, where there's really amb ambiguity about they both really kind of mean the same thing. So this sort of takes that choice away and, and just presents an alternative that, that has one way of expressing uh, things and, and not two. So that's pretty good. And also, I'd, I'd like to just comment that um, in, in looking at trying to express the things from different ecosystems like Bluetooth and Zigbee where they've done uh, bit fields and things like that that, that, that are combined um, or, or, or rather value ranges that are combined. This is, uh, and, and really for the enum and for the other choices, this is really a natural pattern, I guess is really what I mean to say. This is this is something that I would be able to go to and not worry about whether there was some other way or whether I was doing it right. And that's really one of the bigger issues with building a language like this. The developers aren't experts in in languages in config file formats. They just want to have, you know, express a model. And so this provides a way, in, in my opinion, that a pretty good way to do that. Um, not that there might be better ones, but for now, this is a, a really good, a really good way that I think in all the different ecosystems could 
could use and benefit from. Okay. Thank you. Ari, well, you left the queue. Hmm. Yeah, well, I can comment now. I, I noticed I had a bit hard time following the discussion and taking notes at the same time. Um, maybe a um, bit of back, background, like, um, so we're now combining the enum and, and the choice. So pardon me, I don't quite remember our discussions we had before I went for my leave, so my brain has lost a few months of uh, discussion. Um, but can you go back to what we had earlier in the slides? Slide 27. Yes, and here it was so we could have either the property would have a either a static type or it could be an enum. Here's what this tries to express. Is that correct? I don't know what a static type is, but uh, among the types we have available are any kind of type and uh, enums. Okay. Because I'm, yeah, maybe this this example is perhaps a, a slightly confusing without knowing the background of the what the data model is actually trying to express. So the background is that they had a byte and and had to find uh, a way to encode uh, the various things they wanted into that byte, and it's funny that they don't have a maximum device where you're permitted because. Uh, but where you can only have two extremes and not three. Um, and um, so we, we, we are trying to, to represent this um, choice between the, the uh, actual setting, which, which doesn't have a name here in, in the any of, and uh, the, the um, instructions uh, for deriving a setting where we have a minimum device uh, and the previous value. And we are all trying to encode this into a single byte. Okay, but I see. So it's, just, so it's the same value uh, interpreted in two different ways, in a sense. Like, I mean, same value on the wire. The, the, the value is 0, 1, 254, or 255, or something in between. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if the value is zero, you interpret as as an enum. If your value is one to two fifty four, you interpret as a yes, a level. Yes, I see. Good. That, that's really a representation thing, and, and not uh, information. Uh -huh. Good. Okay, then if you can go back to the proposal. You and so if I was standing at the mic in a room, you probably would have seen me. But what I wanted to say was that. The actual modeled intention of this pattern, if, if you had out of band things, you would, you would have probably left the setting at zero to 255 and would have created two exclusive out of band states. And so if I was rebuilding this from scratch, I would create probably two resources, one that had the, the settings and maybe three settings, one which would be value, the other would be minimum, the other would be set to previous. And when I set it at value, it would use the scalar that was the value that would have the full range. But since they wanted to pack things, uh, they, they took this other alternative. But you see that this pattern would be useful in modeling the intended pattern with the range that you wanted. It could be 0 to 255, and there could be two other, two other things. And you would be free to map these in a mapping file differently if you wanted to. Um, and implement them in any way you wanted, as long as you had the property of these being exclusive. And the fact that you express it as a choice does basically say that you want it exclusive. And this is what I mean by saying it's a natural pattern for implementing what the higher level intention, the semantic intention behind the weirdness in the model. Okay, th thanks. Now, now I understand. I think yeah, this seems like a useful pattern, especially when you're trying to represent ecosystem-specific things uh, as accurately as, as possible. Um, probably for the 
consolidated models, we would do it by a different way and then have it easier mapping to other systems, but ecosystem specific models. Now, now I, I understand the use case here. That's okay, right. The values, mm -hmm, the values would go into a mapping file, but they're shown here just as, as a convenience so we can visualize the pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Ari, you have your, one comment. You're allowed to put these constraints in if you want, um, but, but um, normally you would want to do it in a way that's flexible in the definition and doesn't put the constraints in until you map it. Uh, you had one comment in, in the issues uh, somewhere uh, that I think is, is interesting. Uh, so you said if we arrange the, the branches in an array, we can use the indexing of the, that array as an implicit label. So I, I didn't quite pick this up. Uh, but we, we could pull a JavaScript here and say that the choice actually can be either a map like we see on, on the screen here, or it can be an array where the, the index actually takes the, the meaning of the uh, map key of, of the label, actual setting, minimum device, and so on. Um, I just uh, don't have an example where I actually would like to to use this, so I, I didn't uh, mm. set up such an example. But if we mm. really want to, to benefit from this implicit ordering in the array, then we could do that. But we also need to, to warn people that having this uh, implicit numbering, of course, is very brittle. So when they change the, the set of uh, entries, the numbers change and all hell breaks loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, using the array index going was kind of potential way to get around of that, like, we don't want to assign IDs. But yeah, you have very good point on the, on the brittleness of that. Um, my, my point was mainly, um, yes, we did discuss earlier that things like object ID and resource IDs maybe don't belong uh, in the um, kind of information model level because they will be very different in different ecosystems. But I would argue that when it comes to enums, that they are rather tightly scoped. Um, uh, there's a good chance that like um, those same index or, or same values would be used across multiple ecosystems. And then like making less effort for the mapping file, you just say use the values from the information model as the values in the um, on the wire would be very convenient that you don't actually have to, or otherwise all the ecosystems would have the same mapping, you know, have, have to do the same mapping to the IDs uh, all over again. And the using the array would be one way to implicitly get such indexes, but you do have a point that it's, it is brittle. Um, but I would still argue that having some way of indicating this somehow either ordering or, or some way where you can easily derive the on the wire um, value would be very useful for enums, even if we don't want to do it for object IDs and resource IDs. Yeah, so let, let me reply to that before uh, Michael gets next. Um, basically, there are two cases where what, what you are saying makes sense. Uh, one is an ecosystem actually decides to do all their development in SDF. They no longer use their own uh, weird way to write models. They write all their models in SDF. And for that ecosystem, it becomes very onerous to, to actually uh, do their numbering in, in a separate uh, file and set up all, all the back and forth pointers and so on. So for those ecosystems, we want to be able to put something like an ID in there, but it probably would be a good idea to label that ID with actually the name of the, the ecosystem. And in a converged situation, uh, you may have this situation where there's just an industry standard way of, of uh, giving R the number zero and G the number one and B the number two or something like that. And there is no point in, in uh, doing all the same ecosystem specific uh, mapping for all ecosystems because all ecosystems use the same mapping. 
and that would also be a, a, a place where we would want to uh, put IDs into um, the the uh, into the model. In this case, the converged uh, model, and uh, then we wouldn't have a need to to uh, generate tons of uh, mapping files. So I think th there is a good reason to have that. Uh, but I th also think uh, there, there needs to be a naming scheme that uh, avoids uh, collisions. Mm, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We, yeah, we cannot dictate what is what is used. So I think it's it would be one natural way would be that the mapping file can over, always overwrite the default, or it's simply if you don't say anything, the default is is used. But um, but yeah. I, I can imagine there would be a lot of cases like when an ecosystem adopts a model from the converse set. But they, I mean, there is no conflict because they don't have that kind of a thing yet. Simply being able to use it uh, as such would, would be convenient instead of needing to every time come up with a, with, with a mapping. It's the one small step less, less to do. And for those translators that they could have, ah, okay, this is the default case. I don't need any extra piece of code of doing mapping. Let's do one 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 and one can push the same values across. I I think that would be valuable thing to enable. But again, probably we'll 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 see with a few examples of mapping files having those or not having those if it makes a big difference. But my hunch would be that that would be a useful thing to have, um, kind of default value for the uh, enum. So what I wanted to say was that I, I think first um, we we kind of probably resolve that just relying on an array index, which is an artifact of the chosen representation, which is already an approximation, is probably not a good idea. But fortunately, we have a facility called default that already exists in JSON schema that we can use to specify these that really has a well well-defined way of behaving that probably suits our requirements, as well as another one called constant. So I think what we need to do is look at default and constant of JSON schema, which I put in both of these in some different examples in different places, and see if that meets the needs of explicitly defining a something that we might use if for a converged model or for, as Karsten said, if there was some industry standard numbering that we could build in. See if default or constant or some combination of that um, when an overrides actually meets the needs that you that you want. I think default is actually the, the totally the wrong way to express this because default means the the entire range is available and uh, there's uh, if, if the, the value is not present then this is equivalent to the value being present and having the default value. So if you think about minimum device value permitted here, if th that's at default zero, uh, this would mean uh, whenever the minimum device value permitted is not there, um, it's a zero. And if it's there, it can be 45. And, and that's certainly not what is intended in this example. So we could invent something new, but we wouldn't call it default because default has this very, very different meaning. I think there needs to be four more examples to use the point. Yeah, I think Michael put up an example in, in one of the issues. Um, trying to remember which one this was. Because we have, we want an example with actually ID numbers. I, I think if we want to resolve, but um, I think that um, yeah, if you, I, I I can't point to one either right offhand that that I did that actually uses ID numbers. Maybe one of the IPSO example. I just put it in like label or or description or something for the time being because I wanted to put it in a mapping file. But we also have constant, and if we make constant to be overridable, that might be a better way of saying it. But but also, Karsten, as you say, maybe different uh, a different system of accounting for maybe multiple numbering sets in line or something like that might be something if we have more 
more uh, use cases, we might find that's a better solution. But um, yeah, I, I, I guess I get your point on default. It, it's something I just used in the examples. But uh, yeah, we, we don't want it to be put in if you don't specify anything. That's not the desired behavior. Yeah, I'm like a maybe good good way forward. Like if we could um, like kind of do a, a three way. I mean three different ecosystems um, example of, of of some existing enum and see how would how would it look like. I think that the choice pattern what we see here. I I don't see any obvious problems with that. I mean one potential thing to think about would be this array approach, but. Good point on, on the brittleness, so maybe this const approach is is better uh, for it, and then see how, how how it looks like. But I think this is going to good direction. So if you have a tool that generates this, that tool of course can do the numbering and uh, insert zero, one, two, three, four, five as labels in, into uh, the choice. It's only when you do this manually that uh, it becomes a little tedious, but it's not that tedious, and it also saves you from the brittleness. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a good idea to use the array position to assign some ecosystem ID number that you're going to then depend on. So most languages that have this IOTA kind of thing where, where you have automatic numberies, numberings uh, have a way to um, switch to a position in the numbering scheme in the middle of, of the sequence, um, which is easy to do if, if you can invent your own syntax. It just becomes very ugly if you have to express it in JSON. By the way, there is also an email that Walter, no, not an email. Uh, um, uh, can, can you go to the um, issue list, issue number two? that maybe um, we should do that. And I do that by stopping my screen sharing, starting my screen sharing, yes. Uh, application window, that one. We got too big. We wanna go to number two. Yes. So right at the end, there's a comment from Walter. Yeah, that, that's um, pretty much a prototype for the things that happen if, if you only have a hammer. Um, so uh, starting to encode information in the labels and having to parse the label to, to actually extract the structure. Uh. I mean, tool, tools that, that extract uh, JSON schema org stuff uh, and, and populate this from JSON schema org won't have a big problem um, actually doing the, the renaming from whatever JSON schema org uses to uh, what we use. Uh, so they would rename both any of and, and uh, STF enum into choice, and they would have to invent some labeling for the any of case. I don't think that's a big problem. <clears throat> Ari, you're still in the queue. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to leave the queue. But but since now I'm 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 here. Um, you had a good point about this turning the, the SDF and description in, in the JSON schema. And, and does this using choice for both bring us challenges there? That whether it returns to the enum or whether it turns into a, uh, SDF any? Well, if I were writing the code, uh, I would uh, look into the choice 
and see if any of the branches are uh, singletons, singleton types with just a string in them. And then I would uh, put all these things into a, a, a JSON schema or enum and put everything else into an any of. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. I think so. Good. Yeah, maybe actually developing a bit of that tooling would reduce some of Walter's concerns um, on that. I wonder if we do have do we have Walter today. He said he, he had a conflict. Okay, too bad. Um, but yeah, that could maybe be a, a useful thing to look at next in, in our hacking exercises on this actually turning these constructs into standard JSON schema org for those who, who rely on those. Yeah, next week yeah. is a great week to, to do a little hackathon. I mean, all the Americans are uh, doing their virtual Thanksgiving, but uh, uh, we Europeans can, can work together and, and uh, fix this. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, yeah, because yeah, I, I think like for, for me, the main reason why the plain enum doesn't work is that it, it's missing even a way to add description. Like if that's yeah. something what, what we, we really need and I don't want to have an awkward way to add description because I think that should be part of it almost every time. So we anyway need something more powerful than the plain JSO enum. So Michael is also in the queue. Please say that um, having a stable URI in the JSON pointer is pretty important also. And the, as, as we've shown that, that trying to maintain array ordering to create that stable URI is, is um, error prone, brittle. So should we go back to the slides? Yeah, next slide. So this uh, yeah. finish it. Carson, sorry, sorry, just on the previous one, did we really decide on what to do next? Because it felt like we are Still in a bit of discussion. Yeah. Should we implement the choice as and test it out, as Ari said, or? Yes. Okay. I think we, we build more examples and convince ourselves that, that the way forward we have discussed actually makes sense. Okay, good. The key points was that an example and that a mapping to three different ecosystems was key. Um, and I guess because they would each wind up with co some conflict that would have to be resolved or some uh, inconsistency that wouldn't just be pick one of the two, right? Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I understood about the three point. Maybe I was wrong. Yeah, that's really one question that, that was kind of on the next slide, but not very visible. Um, the the question really we we need to find out is can we make any progress on the actual mappings so right now everybody has uh, some form of mapping file in their uh, various tools and, and that's probably a good thing because it allows us to to get these tools working um, but the question would be can we actually achieve some some commonality in the mapping so we actually can standardize at least an overall structure uh, for those uh, mappings in, into which then of course ecosystems have to put in their ecosystem specific uh, material. Uh, and if yes, is this something we are going to aim for for SDF 1.1 or is that going to be the first thing we want to work on for SDF 1.2? Yeah. 
Ari, you're on the queue. Ari, you're on the queue, and you're muted if you're, <laughs> we can't hear you. About that. <laughs> so <let me> <laughs> uh, Go ahead. So, yeah, on, on, on Carson's comment on, on the mapping fire, I think it absolutely makes a lot of sense to stress the structure. things we have come up with and what are the commonalities there. Um, for the for these uh, different ecosystems, uh, yeah, as, as, as Margarita was asking, like, yeah, I think it's, it's a key that we pick a multiple and then we see how we, how well it, this system maps to each. And if we see, see something that doesn't work with an ecosystem, okay, then we have to come back to the, to the drawing board. And to that extent, I was actually, interested of asking like everyone here in the session today like um i mean many of you have must have worked on different enums in different ecosystems like in, in any reflections you have right now or if you have something few ecosystems that we are ourselves actively working on if you have worked on some ecosystems with these kind of structures, it would be very good to get your feedback uh, on, on, I mean, of course, all the issues, but this one in particular is perhaps something that you may have use on. So either right now or, you know, later on, on on the list or in one of the interims. Just wanted to get that kind of, um, if anyone has right now any comments on. Okay, so with respect to the, the item number three on, on this slide, um, I think it indeed would be good to have an example that maps to multiple uh, ecosystems, even if we don't standardize the mapping file exactly at this point in time. I think we can all understand the various syntaxes that we have been using for, for mapping uh, files. So I th still think we can examine this as part of examining uh, this example and see if we really can close number two and number five in, in this way. Okay, this doesn't mean that the, the set of issues uh, is, is closed or something. Uh, people can still propose uh, new issues. Um, and uh, in particular, number seven probably needs another set of examples to look at. So that, that would be another uh, thing to discuss. And uh, my point of view is that we uh, really should uh, go to a, a somewhat time boxed uh, release uh, process. Uh, I, I don't have a detailed idea of what a good rhythm would be, um, but uh, I think uh, given that we have various uh, uh, holidays in the way, it may be a good idea to use December 8th as the date for a final draft for uh, 1.1, which most likely will be a dash or two. Um, and uh, then do something like like a comment period on that, uh, or working with last call, or however you want to call that. Um, and uh, then uh, we uh, use the, the comments on that uh, to have a dash or three that is SDF 1.1 under the Christmas tree. So that would be my, my suggestion for this year. Yeah, and, and then we will time a virtual interim uh, around this December timeframe to sort of, yes. if there are final things to fig figure out, absolutely. Yeah, it needs to be in the week before the 22nd because we may need some editing to actually get this, yeah. this draft done. Uh, yeah, around mid-December, so yes. um, before people head off for vacations or well, yeah. whatever happened this year, but but yes. Uh, any objections to that plan or concerns or so? Great. 
and I think we have a plan at least for the rest of the year. Uh, so, and then there's, I think we're, yeah, the final one. Carson. Yeah, so for 1.2, I think we should uh, really revisit our success factors and, and think about what we need to do to make this really work well. And uh, of course, one success factor was enabling conversion of existing ecosystem models to, to SDF. So I think we, we have done that to a certain extent, and we are now opening up the domain, the, the, the subset of the ecosystem models that, that can be uh, translated. Uh, but of course, we also have to keep, uh, keep track of the ones that cannot yet be translated into SDF 1.1 and see if there is a 1.2 feature that would help with that. So that, that's one part, but I think the other part is uh, to actually make SDF attractive as a development language for new ecosystem models. So uh, imagining that, that say, uh, IPSO or, or OCF uh, might go ahead and actually write SDF uh, on the way to their ecosystem uh, models and, and either uh, translate it into the, the legacy format or give up the legacy format or uh, maybe manually derive their legacy format. Uh, but uh, the, the main point about SDF should be that it's attractive as a development um, language. And uh, that's something we haven't done very much yet. And where the, the actual stress testing, uh, what happened in the ecosystems, that wouldn't happen here or, or over at, at one data model. It would be the, the Bluetooth people or the Zigbee people or the, the Ipso people actually trying this out and see whether it's useful for them. Um, so what we need is uh, more ecosystems, of course, that actually try this and uh, good feedback links from those ecosystems. So we, we actually find out what they are struggling uh, with. Um, and th that's something that we probably should uh, focus on for, for early 2021. And uh, from a time boxing perspective, uh, I think we should aim for uh, SDF 1.2 draft completed uh, before IETF 1.10. So we have a uh, little more than two months uh, to in, in the new year uh, to do this. So that, that would be my personal goal, but of course we don't know whether that goal is uh, realistic or not. Okay. I mean, I think it's uh, well. It's it's two months. It's not very long time, but um, I think we'd have to revisit that early next year when we see if other ecosystems join up or not. But um, or I mean, as we get experience. But uh, as a, as a proposed, I mean, I think we can head for this. Okay. So that was my last slide. So, thank you, Karsten. Um, so, uh, we are now uh, at the end of the uh, scheduled content for this meeting. Uh, is there any other business? Oh. Oh, I just thought I would put the calendar here. So, there was a mention of this date. And there was a mention of this date. And what I heard was that we needed to have the virtual interim in here. Yeah. And we need to decide it two weeks in advance, right? So this on this date, we need to decide which day we're going to pick in here. Yeah. So I would say the 14th or the 15th of December. Now, so there was some interest in using this slot on Monday that 1DM has sometimes used or regularly used. Yeah, we, I mean, we, yes. Might be the it's... simplest ways to just, just go for that. And if that's wrong, then we could fix it. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, they, that uh, it works 
works for the 1DM folks, uh, I guess. Uh, the problem is it's, it's not a very convenient time for folks on the Pacific <laughs> time zone. It's uh, right. 1400 UTC. So it's it's, um, uh, 7 it's, it's a bit early. 14 uh, minus 9. 3. 3 a.m. No, I can't do yeah. math right now. So it's, it's early. So, so uh, but um, we yeah. can at least um, have this tentative. I think we could do a doodle anyway, but maybe not okay. so many dates, just the dates on the... Uh, uh, so maybe we'll do a doodle for 14th and 15th at a number of different times. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, if, if you want, I'm curious to know, because we have 50 some people, how many would come to the virtual interim? Like put the use the raise hand to uh, give us an idea of how many we should expect to consider as terms of the uh, the we have a, a range of opinions about time periods. So that's it. Only six, seven people. I hope we can get voter next time. Yeah. So a few other people. Any comments from those who are not involved? Is, is, did you understand this work? Do you understand where it's going and what we're doing? Um, yeah, I specifically want someone to walk up and say, I haven't read the document, but. So it's Nigel Davis here. I haven't read the document, but uh, <laughs> it seemed to make some sense. To me, very much so. Okay. Anything yeah. else? We can. We have. We're not. All, we're, it's not forbidden to end early. But on the other hand, I don't want to give up the time if there's something useful that we can uh, do. If you don't mind me just asking a couple of questions, I I'm, I'm involved in work at ONF and we're using UML as a modeling language and we found that um, useful as a uh, for a representation. It's graphical, obviously not just um, textual. We we actually have a set of tooling we um, have developed that we use to generate Yang from UML. Um, uh, be interested in maybe just understanding how you would see UML and also you talked about um, obviously different bodies generating their their languages or maybe abandoning their languages but if not generating languages from your um, more general language a uh, more uh, broadly applicable language and um, I wonder whether you'd be thinking of generating tooling or whether you'd expect them to generate tooling or whatever else in that area so, so both um, use of UML and what your opinions are of that and also um, tooling for language translation, which we found quite challenging, actually. <laughs> but, uh... So you're generating Yang from UML. I'm curious, do you then serialize it to what? JSON, Seabor, XML? JSON or XML, yeah, JSON. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, I mean, the tooling's I mean, obviously, a large part of this work is around tooling um, and yeah. uh, enabling sort of machine translation. Yes. Uh, however, the the focus of, I mean, the initial, I mean, the initial motivation behind it was to translate between the data models of different ecosystems. Yes. And uh, so, I think there is. Uh, I don't think. I mean. With, with sufficient amount of uh, digital glute uh, sort of duct tape, you can translate from any system to any system. But I with, think it's reason, it's yeah. you know, <laughs> but 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 there is a, it's absolutely interesting. All kinds of translation is interesting. So we had and during the hackathon there was one participant who looked at translating SDF to back into uh, uh, to and from uh, Jang, for instance. So there there mm -hmm. is a lot of different, but it 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 also. Uh, Given that this is a bit of a domain specific, uh, it's oriented around modeling these things or the IoT devices. Yes. Um, and so, so it has some kind of limitation on the general general um, applicability. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's definitely so that it's 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 relevant. And I think we will, as we reach out at looking at additional ecosystems that already do their modeling, information modeling in, in uh, UML, like OPC UA, for instance, uh, we will encounter this. So, so um, 
uh, interested, but not quite sure how to sort of map things together. Yeah, I understand. No, it's fine. Just, just, just generally interested in what your views were. So we, we found uh, you all know a richer language than Yang in some dimensions, and hence it was lossy as a mapping. So we um, we lose some aspects of the model. We have to also orient the model in a particular way. We have to make it hierarchical uh, more so than we would traditionally do with a networking model. We tend to see it as meshy, and you know you sort of get get forced into bending a meshy model into a hierarchy. So um, we, we we may have overdone that as well. Um, and we may have been able to go for a forest of trees rather than the tree, but we seem to have gone for a single tree and hence we've distorted our model in you know, some, <laughs> somewhat. But, uh, anyway, so I was just interested in, uh, because we found some challenges doing the mappings. Um, we've, we've got a tool that runs, but it's not perfect. And we also found challenges getting people to write tooling. Mm. So, it's, so yeah, I mean, what prepared. we have, yeah. yeah. So, so what we Go have ahead, today is, is is basically the, the the tooling that can translate. I mean, SDF uh, from uh, SDF to OCF and to IPSO and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we have looked at the others, Bluetooth and so on, that can do that. That's a bit more challenging. But, but uh, yet, even even with these kind of limited limited uh, application, it's it still generates. Uh, there's a bunch of headaches, and as you say, I mean, there's a yes. lot of these kind of abstraction level headaches that you, yeah. in particular, when you need to address multiple um, uh, receivers, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So, very interesting. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> Carson. Can you maybe send a pointer to the ASDF mailing list, pointing to a few of your UML models and the Yang you generated from that? And so that would allow us to. Yeah, I can. I can try and do that. <laughs> I can try and do that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm. I've not been. To, I've been to a couple of ITF meetings some about ten years ago. So <laughs> get myself reintroduced into how to do that. But yes, I can do that. Yes, certainly. Yeah, very simple informal message to the mailing list is all. all yeah, no, it's fine. It's great. Yeah, I've got. I've got some. Um, we've got um, a. We, we're in. We, we're working Git. GitHub. So I can send you links to that, and uh, we have some d documentation on the. Um, modeling mechanisms and approaches and so on in uh, in a very open, in both of our um, repositories are, repositories are very open so in ONF we um, you don't even need a password to get the uh, documents through ONF and um, uh, get obviously you can you can see so well, we, we are not just not just interested in documentation we are in particular interested no no in that's, we've got them we've got them I've got the tooling and the models in Git so as yeah. far as it means more it's more the documentation explains the um, mapping rationale and then the tooling in theory <laughs> supports the actual mapping um, and yeah. mapping definitions it's not perfect though so we have to do a bit of hand crafting at the end of it but, uh, so examples that what you think are good representation of what you're trying to do that that's probably the most useful. Part, uh, right. can we try to do that. I'll, I'll try and get a bit more involved in this because it does seem very related to what we've been trying to do ourselves. We're looking for a, a consistent common modeling approach across um, multiple bodies. We actually work with MEF, ITT, and um, um, I think for others, yeah, MEF, ITT, ONF, certainly at the center of the uh, sort of relationship around UML. So, so okay, I'll, I'll, I'll enter to that, yeah, sorry. So, any other final comments? We still have, well, half an hour. Um, but we still have some time left. Other comments or questions or viewpoints or, or etc. If all else, all else fails, you can play the tutorial. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that would be brainwashing. Uh, yeah, if you haven't, please see the tutorial. It's good and it explains the basics of this work. And um, yeah, as I said at the start here, if you are part of an organization where you think this could be useful, please reach out to us and we'll, we can uh, uh, figure out how to work together or at least describe the work we're doing to you. Hmm? So I think we have, um, oh, here we go. Michael is quick. So this is, the times here are in From, time zone. It's in, it's in the time zone is mine, is Eastern. So that would be 4 a.m. Pacific. 
and uh, and that would be uh, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific or plus six to Europe is 7 p.m. So that's a bit late. Okay. Hmm. And apparently Great. I'm available on all those times. So. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, um, uh, good. I mean, you will send out the link to that on the list, I guess. Uh, we will have a, um, uh, uh, further work on this to wrap it up. Uh, I don't know, if Karsten, if we should try to organize something next week for this, like a hackathon or a something like that. Um, yeah, please let me know if you want to. We need to set something up. Um, so what, what last week was essentially the, the daily one-hour sync. Uh, and that, that would be the same organization that, that I would propose for, for next week. So th there's going to be a one-day meeting on Monday. So you probably don't need a sync there. Uh, but having something like, like a one-hour sync on, on Tuesday to, well, I hope not Friday, Tuesday to Thursday, uh, might be the best way to get this happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let, let's think about that so we can make, make, make it work out with people's schedules. Um, I guess people are busy now, closing up to the vac vacations. But okay, let's, let's try with that. That would be really good to have this finished. Good. Anything, um, anything else? Calling once, calling twice. Uh, then I think we are unless Michael starts waving here. <laughs> and I think we are done for the day. So uh, thank you everybody for your time and uh, great having you here. I hope this was interesting. And uh, if you uh, now feel that you will be want to hack this, please let us know so we can include you in the hackathon. They will send out the link on the ISDF list for the hackathon as well, for the upcoming hackathons around this. And uh, as said, we have a plan to work towards. We have plans for the various open issues, and I think we can make progress in the, with this in the in the near future. Okay, with that, I think we are done for the day. So uh, off to sleep, all of you in, in the US, <laughs> and uh, for us, it's in Europe as it's lunchtime. Okay, thank you very much. Take care. Cheers. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.